All right, welcome back. And we're going to take you back to the year 1962. The World's Farewell was the biggest thing in the world. The centerpiece, the iconic Space Needle, which cost $4.5 million to build, which was actually a fortune back then. Dubbed the 400-day wonder because that's how quickly they built it, the iconic tower, known all over the world as the Seattle Space Needle, was open for business. Historian Felix Vanell joins me now to share more about the history of this tower and the surrounding Seattle Center. I'm so excited to talk to you about this, Felix. Welcome to the show. Yeah, it's the 60th anniversary of the Seattle World's Fair and everything pretty much at Seattle Center. It's a very exciting occasion. You can't exaggerate and you can't overstate how much impact that fair had on the community in terms of really focusing our, 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 our innovation and our belief in the power of the future to inspire everybody. And there's nothing better that symbolizes the future and that fair than the Space Needle. Absolutely. It's, oh, I'm sorry it, to cut you off. I'm just, you no, know, no, I mean, it's 60 years old, yeah. but it still looks crazy and futuristic. I mean, you look around the rest of Seattle, we have some pretty bizarre looking newer buildings but everything looks like old school compared to this this pointy thing north of downtown with the sphere on top or this disc on top that rotates around and has a restaurant in it. I mean, it's still a, a, it's a wonder of the architectural world. And I love living in Seattle and taking it for granted because every time I go there, I was there last night celebrating the 60th anniversary and it's still exciting. It never fails to make me excited to walk around the outside, walk around the inside, even just look out and see all the views of the city. The fact they designed it and built it so fast is amazing, yeah. too. I like there's there's some old posters from the fair from like 1961 in advance of the fair. It shows the Space Needle, but it doesn't doesn't look like the one that was actually built because they hadn't really designed it yet. They designed and built it so quickly, yet so successfully. It's this perfect marriage of an innovative idea. You know, you have Eddie Carlson, one of the guys who's running the World's Fair. He has this idea for something like a balloon on a string. Mm. And he's seen this, uh, the Fernsehturm in Germany, in Stuttgart, Germany, which is this tall TV tower that has an observation deck on it. And then John Graham, who's a structural engineer, he's built a hotel in Hawaii that has a rotating restaurant as part of its, uh, its structure. And they marry these two ideas, and it comes together in this incredible, incredible attraction that... You know, it, it drew millions of people visited during the fair. Something like more than two million people went up into the needle during the fair. Yeah. But it just, be, but it became the symbol of the city. And I, I've never been able to pin this down. I don't know when it actually happened that the Space Needle stopped being just this sort of carnival ride restaurant at the <laughs> fair. Yeah. It became I mean, a, a symbol for the entire city. It's so cool. It is amazing how it did just that because it really is. I mean, as you say today, I was looking at some of the other towers that you were mentioning. We had them on the screen and they just don't compare when it comes to the beauty and the elegance that is the Space Needle. And, and it does look great. It was built, obviously, for the World's Fair. Let's talk about some of the other buildings that were part of this that make up the Seattle Center now, because they're also pretty iconic. Yeah, and it's brilliant. Uh, one of the guys who worked on the fair, this guy in his 90s named uh, Louis Larson, he told me the World's Fair was the creation of a civic campus designed, you know, disguised as a carnival. You had this wonderful six month event, but meanwhile, you also got these incredible things built that we're still using today. Probably my favorite is it's now called Climate Pledge Arena. Mm -hmm where the Kraken play and where the Sonics used to play. It was built as a Washington State Pavilion during the fair. It housed the Bubble Later and all these other exhibits. But then it became this incredible place to have concerts and sports and everything. You had the Pacific Science Center, which was funded by a uh, huge investment by the federal government. You know, we had we'd just been beaten into outer space by the Russians. We were mm. trying to play catch up. And so focusing on science became a natural for this fair, sort of in the, at the, the dawn of the space age. It all fit together. The look and feel of the Space Needle, the need to kind of compete with the Russians and in getting into space, and this idea of trying to inspire a whole generation of kids and grown-ups even to embrace the future the way that Seattle has always embraced the future from the yeah. very earliest time that settlers arrived here back in the 19th century. It was always about the future. You know, it was called New York eventually. It was what they called Seattle. That was its nickname. That's and fascinating. The World's Fair was like, that was eventually, it was finally here in 1962. We'd finally achieved this love and show of our love for the future that was embodied by Boeing before the fair, you know, with the right. jets and things they were building. But this way, everybody got to participate. Everyone got sucked in. Everyone got to go to the fair and use push button phones for the first time. Do you feel like- think about flying cars. Do you- <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get the flying cars though. Felix, <laughs> do you feel like having the fair here really kind of solidified Seattle as a major city center in the world? Absolutely, there's just, you cannot overstate, you cannot exaggerate how much that fair transformed a sleepy Northwest city far from the other big population centers in the US 
and put us on the map. And apart from putting us on the map and creating the incredible Seattle Center campus, it showed a lot of young people mm -hmm. who worked on that fair that they could go on and do even bigger things. We did all sorts of stuff in the 1960s and the 1970s in Seattle, and many of those things were done by people who cut their teeth working at the fair, wow. learning how to put on events, learning how to um, attract investors, learning how to communicate with the, the international press to talk about what we're doing. Yeah. All those people were like sort of civic engineers learning how to get stuff done. They did it at the fair, and then they took those skills and applied it to everything, like transportation and building and you know all sorts of stuff that, that any big city has to deal with. And Seattle just arrived. And yeah. there's just, again, you cannot overstate how much that, what impact that fair had. It and the really... fact it left that beautiful campus so we can all enjoy. I mean, last night there was a hockey game going on. I think there was ballet going on. Wow. It's still this vibrant, vibrant place that we're so lucky to have. I love Seattle Center. I've been going there every, I'm in my early 50s. Every phase of my life, Seattle Center has played some important role. It's a little different I, in each decade, I could, maybe. I could not yeah. agree with you more, Felix. It is yeah. just an incredible place to go. It's an incredible place to be. Thank you for taking your time and sharing that. And I have a little bit of tidbit for you I had to share. At the King County Fair in Enumclaw, they have parts of the original buildings that were for the World Fair that they have and they use now to this day. I, All right, thank you. I know you. those buildings. Beautiful concrete. Yeah. All Happy right, 60th Felix. anniversary. We'll talk to you soon.